production underwriting for Ruckus has been made possible in part by the generous contributions from Fred and Lou Hartwig and from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. In the Kansas City, Missouri School District, the new superintendent is the same man who's been serving as interim superintendent. Dr. Steve Green now has a two-year contract at $250,000 per year. Some question the timing of the appointment just a day ahead of school board elections, but board president Eric Leonard West said the deal has been in the works for weeks and that bringing stability to the district is paramount. So what are the implications of these two events, a board election and a permanent superintendent? When? Well, I think <laughs> one implication in this, in this case, of course, is like the timing. I think uh, the timing is highly questionable for this board to uh, make uh, Green permanent in the right at, at the uh, brink of having an election that could actually bring on four new board members. So when you say you are promoting stability, what you're actually doing is setting up a, a situation that could create more conflict and turmoil, especially if, say, the four people coming on the board, all they have to do is, is coalesce one other vote if they're not pleased with Green, and then there you go back into this, you know, getting rid of the superintendent issue. The other, the other issue is that it may mean nothing, because here we are at the state level, you have two bills pending. One is the Lair bill, bill, one is the, is the Pierce bill, both of which would, would give the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education the opportunity to come in immediately and take over the district. With that, DESE is empowered to void all contracts, including the contract of the superintendent. Therefore, and, and appoint a state-appointed board, a uh, state administrative board, which could come in and hire its own CEO to administer over the affairs of the district. But, but, but Dr. Green knows what he's getting into. He, he's there. He's been through this. He knows what the possibilities are. Yeah, he, he's getting a $250,000 <laughs> contract, so I, I might yeah. sign on, on for that as well, given the situation. But, and Gwen, I think, raises an excellent point, which is basically if they mess with Green, the school board's history, and, and then should be. Now, I know that we also may disagree on how good Dr. Green is, but in that respect, if you go ahead and get rid of the superintendent now, and I, and I totally agree with you that they shouldn't have, shouldn't have appointed him right before the election. I mean, that's just, that's, uh, that's stupid. Crazy. But if they do go ahead and get rid of him, I think it just gives everybody, oh, wait a minute, this board's out of control, the superintendent's out of control. Well, 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 so so they, what, they what was the motive for appointing him the day before the election? Well, they claim the that they've been working on this for some right. time, yeah. and so yeah. they finally, you know, came to closure on it. But still, you've got an election. What you do is say, but, we will, we will yeah. hold up on this decision and, uh, until the outcome of the election. It may very well prove that the same, most of the same people will be there, and they can move forward. It's just a matter of a few weeks. Right. So I don't understand the urgency of it. You're right. You know, it, it was just inappropriate behavior. Mary, which is <laughs> was the school board election on Tuesday a debacle, a fiasco? How would you describe it? <laughs> An uplifting moment a disaster? in Kansas City uh, history. Oh, <laughs> dancing, howling at the yeah. moon. Um, no, I, I really, I, I don't like to uh, make fun of this situation because it's just so, it's just so constantly urgent. Humor does relieve some of the some of the stress of it all but it, the, the the problem here is that who's going to who's taking care of business you know who's taking care of the children and i don't whenever things look like they're a little suspicious they probably are you know things are what they seem sometimes and this guy had a terrific contract a quarter of a million dollars in in salary which is a lovely thing and he made a deal with uh, the people that could give it to him, and and he took it. Yeah. So, uh, well, well, what do you explain for us, there? if you would, uh, generally, what happened in this election? Why it's a debacle? Why it's a fiasco? A disaster? I no, believe you disaster. called it. First of all, I want Mary and I finally agree on something. A quarter of a million dollars is a lovely thing. <laughs> it's a lovely thing. It is. Uh, the uh, what happened here is that the voters of Kansas City just sent a message to the folks down in Jefferson City. Yeah. We're really not interested in keeping this elected an elected board. Yeah. Yes. We've, absolutely. We've, yeah. We're so interested. Three to four percent of us turned out to vote, and so yeah. you couple that, I think, with the election to move the schools, those schools, to independence, 
and that this school district voted strongly to mm -hmm. let them go. And, and a pattern yeah. begins to emerge here that the people of this city uh, have decided that the, that, that our experiment in the grassroots democracy is over. Well, listen, there were four seats up. Only in one instance were there candidates on the ballot. Right. The other three were right in candidates. Yes, the computers which, can't figure right, out what names are what when right. people have so written have, them in. So it's going to be days before we know who exactly. has well, been the winner of these different right races. Hey, I mean, Woody's point well, about the low turnout is really yeah. indicative of well, so much. And, and let me just but say. The, I, the fact that people aren't on the ballot might be one of the causes. That would be right. Right. I would like point. to say something about Arthur Benson before we move off this topic. I really, I, I think the people of Kansas. The city as a whole, uh, that he deserves credit for his lifelong interest in the school and his service of desegregation uh, in this in the district. Whether one thinks he was speaking a good of lovely student. amounts of money, yes. Uh, well, <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't think lawyers, no, no, no. Well, we just point out that Mr. Mr. Vinson is no, he was the plaintiff's without attorney. Any money. Oh, uh, he no, worked for many years without any money. Well, uh, look, well, to, to, deny, to deny that somebody's worth their pay, Gail. Oh, no. Hold it. I, I will say this, <laughs> and I, I, I know Benson, and we agree yeah. on virtually nothing. But he does have, and has had since he was a young man, yes. a real passion, passion about uh, desegregated he education. Did. The, the only point he is did. he made a good deal of money, and it was uh, the Second federal government was only on. it was his only client for for a number of years, and I that's knew fine. I him in those years, yeah. and he dedicated. It wasn't that he couldn't have had other clients; is that he chose to have one client. B best guess, Gwen. What's going to happen with this district in the immediate future? <laughs> okay. okay. So if I can answer that question, I don't yeah. think. Well, then I guess we have to right move now. on. Uh, the state of Missouri is in a <clears throat> state of denial. So says the Kansas City Star editorial page in a scathing denunciation of both Governor Jay Nixon and the GOP-dominated state legislature. The Star says as school boards contemplate laying off more teachers, families anguish over excessive tuition rates, and overworked medical professionals struggle to meet demands of an unhealthy state, elected officials deny Missouri's critical condition. Without action, the star believes Missouri is in danger of becoming a second-rate state. So what should the governor and the legislature be doing that they are not, Gail? What do you mean becoming a second-rate state? <laughs> we're just quoting I mean, the we're Kansas there. Star editorial. We, no, we're, I know, but we're there. I mean, you look at all these indicators on, I mean, everything on health care, um, education, all that kind of stuff. Missouri is. It's one of the, the southern states now, which, and I say that demeaningly. Um, it's an area where if you said, you know, we don't like high taxes. And I understand the pushback from Republicans and all the, the people who say, gee, we don't want to have high taxes. Yet you compare with some other states where their taxes aren't that much higher. They just offer a better quality of life. Well, how do they do it? Well, their government's a little more efficient. That, that could be one explanation. But in Missouri, we kind of have this, not only is it show me, it's we can't. We can't raise cigarette taxes. Even though we have unbelievably low cigarette taxes, we can't do it. Now, thankfully, Attorney General Chris Coster's point, you know, pushing back on that, and maybe we'll have an election that gets that money freed up, that would be a great idea. Um, I agree with all the critics that money doesn't solve all these problems. That's why if you had better regulation, sometimes when, like when Woody talks about the good old days when he was in charge of the highway department and all that stuff, you know, they had, they had, I think they had better management back then. I think they actually had people who cared more about the state than they do now in some of these respects. So money doesn't solve all the ills, but if you look at those rankings, it truly is embarrassing that the state is so low on many of them and that the state with probably a little bit of effort, the cigarette tax, um, a little bit, uh, you know, more efficient use of, of state government personnel, a little bit more backbone by the governor of Missouri, the Republican governor of Missouri, Jay Nixon, we'd have a better state. You, you say ah. facetiously the Republican governor. Oh, I, I thought he was a Republican. Well, I, I, know you, I know you okay. say that, but just in case oh, okay. anyone oh, he wonders, he is a, a Democrat, Democrat, the Democratic right. governor. Woody, you've spent years being involved with Missouri uh, politics. You uh, lobby the state legislature in Jeff City. Uh, react to some of what Yale's had to say. Well, look, the, number one, Missouri's been like 43rd to 48th in economic growth for 20 or 30 years. And that has something to do with how much revenue we collect, 
uh, whether people are willing to vote uh, for more taxes, and in this state, basically, any significant tax increase has to be voted on by the people. We had a cigarette tax on the ballot, a tobacco tax on the ballot, a few years ago. Uh, the campaign was it's going to go to help health care, and it was 50 cents a pack, uh, which would have put us comparable with some other states. And the people of this state voted it down. We put it on the ballot, and they said, no, thank you. Barely, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was close. Yeah. But, it, yeah. but, you know, it was a very sympathetic campaign. It was about as good a campaign as you're going to run, mm -hmm. and it lost. It matters what people you put in charge. And at the University of Missouri, for example, George Russell raised tuition every year for five years, <coughs> got the faculty salary up to the average of the AAU public universities, got rid of all deferred maintenance, several other things. His successors came in. They're still collecting the tuition increases. You got the lowest paid faculty in the well, AAU. Where'd the money go? Well, let me get Mary in here. Uh, just, uh, higher taxes, you think that would solve a lot well, of Missouri's problems? Not necessarily, but let's point out one really great area of Missouri government just to toss in a, just to, just to contradict Yale's long diatribe <laughs> against the state. Let's take uh, the Conservation Department of the state of Missouri is the finest in the United States of America. It is so good that it was the only thing, and I moved to this state a long time ago, I said, oh my God, it's just incredibly good. And it continues to be, you know what it is, Mike? Because the people are proud of what they've accomplished. They have a dedicated tax. Yeah. They have a relatively high sales tax in the state of Missouri. It's dedicated to that purpose. And it's splendid. It's not that Missouri can't be great at what it does. It's that it doesn't have legislative leadership to get it done. They are yahoos in Jefferson City. They're the uh -oh. worst in the nation. Well, and, 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 but how do they how do they get there? Well, Lori I, I elected by, elected you, by the okay. people, the now, losers no, of Missouri. Be, before we move on here, and we do have to move on, Gwen, you live in Missouri. Yes, I uh, you happy with your state government? No, I'm not. No, I'm not. <laughs> I, I think you know. The, I think that I when when we were a bellwether state, when we when we were bluer than we are now. We, I mean, we're getting redder and redder. And in my view, the redder we get, the worse the we Republicans get. Republicans. We're, we're starting to look a lot uh, like Mississippi. Well, okay, I agree. all right. Yeah. We, 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 we got to. Yeah, we're starting to look like Mississippi. Penn Valley Park will never be the same, and many will find that good news. The Occupy Kansas City crowd has been evicted after seven months of camping out without legal permission. City officials say it's time to prepare the park for spring and summer activities, including the popular Rock Fest in May, expected to pull a huge crowd. Now that the occupiers have left Penn Valley Park, some are left wondering, why were they there? And what exactly was their purpose? Woody, uh, any chance you know? <laughs> as nearly as I can tell, to hold a camp out. I, I just, I don't know why I should know why they were there if they didn't know why they're there. Uh, they're generally displeased with the order of the universe, or at least that slice of it called the United States of America. Look, uh, at both ends of the political spectrum, from the Tea Party at one end, Occupy at the other, and I, in my world, they're not that similar. But the, the, the complaints, some of those complaints are remarkably similar. And they are a sense that uh, the country's being run by a limited number of elites mm -hmm. who dictate the agenda. And the rest of us are just puppets or ignored or so on. A general feeling of dissatisfaction with the direction of the country. Yeah. And so now, that, then you say, who are these elites? What is their agenda? And you get these entirely different answers that bear no relation to so, each other. And that inability of those two things to come together on that point keeps them from accomplishing. And apparently uh, nationwide, the Occupy movement included a wide variety of people from various walks yeah, of life, no walk of life, people of uh, all ages, more or less. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any empathy with these people or any sympathy for them? <laughs> well, I, I have empathy. Uh, I understand, I think, what called them into action was uh, this, this huge gap between the haves and the have-nots in this country, uh, concern about what was happening on Wall Street and nothing happening on Main Street with the economy, people not having jobs. The challenge for the Occupy Wall Street movement, though, in my view, is the absence of a clear leadership voice with a clear agenda. What is the policy imperative for 
Occupy Wall Street, what, do, what is the impact that they want to have? And so then you, you know, the, the great movement aspect of it, it was great, but once you agitate, you have to have a plan for mediation, for a right, for how do you want to bring about change uh, that is meaningful and transformative in this case. And, and that's what's lacking in Occupy Wall Street. Well, I think that they did, though, break through. You know, social change doesn't come in steady amounts. It comes in bursts of, of action on the part of great group, uh, p groups of people who bring a new consciousness to a question. And what they did was react to Wall Street. This is a reaction to Wall Street by all kinds of folks who said, we are the 99%. And they gave face to this, as Woody mentioned, the gap between the rich and the poor in this country, widening and widening and widening more. I guess it was Gwen who said that, not, not Woody. Say that. Uh, so <laughs> they've accomplished what they set out to do, because guess what? After they began to occupy Wall Street and other streets in the country, the whole country agreed with them. You're right. You're right. The gap is too great, and we need to make Wall Street accountable. Yes. They got bailed out, and nobody else got bailed yes. out, Mike. And that's well, what these people well, object to. If I may, what has changed as a result of this? Movement? A great deal. What the conversation politically the conversation. in well, this country is about whether or not those who who made who did very well in the last decade should pay their fair share, and whether or not wealth in this country ought to be uh, distributed in such a way that at least people get to go to college and own a home. Yeah, and uh, other a couple of questions stuff. for you quickly. Uh, did they accomplish anything in Kansas City meaningful mm -hmm. that you're aware of? And okay. two, how many nights did you camp out? Um, I camped out zero, even <laughs> though I do have empathy like, um, do you? like Ms. Grant does. Uh, however, uh, just to add on to the point, I think they accomplished something in Kansas City, which was to raise the consciousness yeah. of the political debate, and I think the argument is out there. Yeah. I'm glad man, uh, Woody mentioned the Tea Party, and while I don't certainly ascribe to a lot of the Tea Party uh, mentality about this country, what the Tea Party then did in kind of yeah. answer to your question, they went out and voted. They voted in all those Republicans in 2010 to a degree. I mean, they helped get they they helped turn the country in a different direction. If the Occupy people and the people who empathize with some of the views, like Gwen and Mary, they're going to have to vote in 2012. Yeah, uh, here's Absolutely. how Tom Brokaw described the uh, Tea Party movement. He said they they got mad, they got organized, and they got here, meaning they got to Washington yeah. and they got involved in the power structure. That is something that thus far we've not seen, it seems well, they're, to me, they're, from they're the they're Occupy a, movement. kind of a 21st century, yeah. and yeah. They, 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 this group is very broadly democratic. <laughs> they're not intensely partisan. The, the Tea Party democratic thing like was the party a or the Tea democratic party thing was like a Republican okay. All right. This is not yeah, a, no, it's no, not no, a partisan movie. It is <laughs> not <laughs> unusual to see or hear a news story with both Kansas and abortion in the lead. But this story's headline caught my attention. Abortions in Kansas are down. Interestingly, the number has been dropping for the last five years. According to area Planned Parenthood president Peter Brownlee, the reduction is tied to tougher state laws and the death of Dr. George Tiller, the late-term abortion provider. Brownlee also noted that abortions are dropping nationwide, as are unplanned pregnancies. While Brownlee says he is pleased by the Kansas reduction, he suggests women are simply leaving Kansas to have abortions in states with less restrictive laws. So do both pro-choice and pro-life advocates agree, Mary, that fewer abortions in Kansas is indeed good news? Oh, they do, and, and should. Uh, it is good news. Planned Parenthood has always had, and I, I know personally that Peter Brownlee, uh, among them, has always uh, stated that the goal of Planned Parenthood <coughs> is to reduce the number of abortions by providing good health care for women, including contraception, and sex education for young women, and all women for that matter, and good general health care. So the fact that there are fewer abortions is, uh, pleases both sides of this highly, highly political uh, uh, question. Uh, the, the thing that's going on right now in Kansas, Mike, is that Governor Brownback's just uh, ferocious efforts to bring down the heavy hand of government on, on women in every aspect of their reproductive life, you know, uh, in the in the line under Planned Parenthood on their website, it says to provide women with the knowledge and the opportunity and the freedom to control their own reproductive health. 
And that particular goal is just not going any place in Kansas. The, the two laws right now that are about to be made, that he'll sign anything. Governor Brownback, has, <laughs> he will sign anything. He is about to sign a bill if it passes that would allow hospitals to allow to require that doctors not make referrals. So suppose a woman has cancer and she's pregnant and to require that the doctor not treat her cancer for fear that she might have an abortion. That's the kind of thing they're writing into the law. It's shocking and, it, and people ought to know about it. Well, Mike, I'm not a woman. <gasps> but <laughs> if I were a woman, Republican or Democrat, I would be so outraged at how mostly Republican lawmakers across this country, in Kansas, are, are treating women these days. I mean, these are, the, these are Republicans or legislators who say we want to keep government out of things. You know, we want to keep government, you know, smaller government, all that kind of stuff. And yet more and more of these matters that really ought to be left up to the women and the men in families in general are being controlled now by big government. All of the Virginia law, the Kansas law, some of the stuff they're looking at in Missouri. I mean, it really is. If you if you just put yourself as a, as a as a woman, I just I would just be outraged. I mean, over forget politics for a second. Just the fact that they're trying to have government control over so much of your life, it really is uh, bad. But Woody, there can be state restrictions on abortions because of the Supreme Court rulings. Well, that's right. Look, the position of conservatives and pro-life people, at least it's conservative, long-time conservatives, has always been that this is an issue for the states. Roe versus Wade was wrongly decided. And that the states do have the right to regulate abortion, that they have traditionally always done so. This wealth of laws that are getting passed, that, you know, little thing here, a little yeah. thing there, oh. that's all the result of Roe v. Wade. Those laws oh. were not being passed like that no. before Roe oh, v. No. Wade. Oh, no. what, what, what we listen to, to me. Yeah. i got a right to finish, and let yeah. me finish. Yeah. What you had before that finish. were broad-based <laughs> broad laws yeah. that abortion is either legal or illegal in this state. So it's illegal in this state. Now the Supreme Court says you can't do that, but they say you can do some restrictions. So yeah. the legislatures respond by doing the restrictions. Look, that's not inconsistent with the position all along, which is you regulate this at the state level. And oh. we're simply uh, acting on that. The, uh, as we wrap this up, uh, well, do you agree with the, what former President Clinton used to say, uh, Gwen? Uh, abortion should be safe, rare, and legal. Yes, I agree with that. I think a woman has a right to choose, and I think that the system should provide safe options legal options, and then, of course, it, it should be the last resort. But it certainly is the woman's right to choose. And that's what Kansas most, law seems to be men achieving. Most agree with Gwen, no. actually, if you take no. a, a decent safe, poll. It's safe, legal, yes. and rare. Safe, <laughs> rare, safe. and legal. Yes. All, right. All right. Now we turn to Roast and Toast, where the Rockettes pan or praise people and events in the news. <laughs> and we start tonight with Mary. Uh, next Wednesday, I want to toast uh, coming up in the, in the city of Shawnee. The Kansas Families for Education celebrates their 10th anniversary. This wonderful and kind of grassroots organization that, that sprang up 10 years ago, Dave Raffle and Kathy Cook. We're going to honor them for 10 years of service to being the best advocates in the state of Kansas for public education and public school children. And it's at 7 o'clock, Shawnee's Old Shawnee Town. Well, last week I was praising the city council and Mayor Sly James because I thought they were going to have the guts to finally do something about the fire department's um, overstaffing. And left the program, went back to City Hall, stood with my uh, firefighter brothers. And they did have the guts to tell <laughs> the firefighting staff they had too many people and the department needed to be cut. This is a toast to the city council for finally taking that action. Uh, a toast to... Uh, to the much maligned legislators in Jefferson City, and specifically to Representative Scott Dickhouse and to Senator Jane Cunningham, both of whom have managed to get bills moving. The one in the Senate has actually been perfected uh, that do something about the uh, situation in our public schools where seniority determines who gets uh, to keep their job in layoffs, who has tenure and can't be fired. They're trying to fix that at long last. Good work. A toast to everyone who voted on Tuesday in what was really a lackluster election all across the city. But getting out to vote is important, and I salute you for doing so. Those of you who stayed home, shame on you. And finally, a massive toast to actor Will Ferrell for announcing he will return to the big screen in Anchorman. 
The Legend of Ron Burgundy, the sequel. As devoted Burgundy fans know, the original changed forever what we demand in quality motion picture drama. I'm Ron Burgundy? You're so wise. You're like a miniature Buddha covered in hair. No! 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 It is Anchor Man, not Anchor Lady! I don't know what we're yelling about! What are you doing on our station's turf, Burgundy? Come get a taste. And as Ron might say, stay classy, Kansas City. And that's Ruckus for this week. Nick Haynes will host Kansas City Week in Review Friday evening at 7.30. Ruckus returns next Thursday. Now on behalf of the Ruckettes and producer Sean Holmes, Mike Shannon saying Happy Easter, Happy Passover, and thanks for watching. Good night. Production underwriting for Ruckus has been made possible in part by the generous contributions from Fred and Lou Hartwig and from viewers like you. Thank you.